Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Trisha with Insectopia here to sketch another insect with you. I already see Susan hanging out with us in the chat. I really appreciate that. Welcome. Um, she said she was seeing some frost and elfin butterflies today. Um, and those are, and that's awesome that you were able to see those. Admittedly, I'm not sure what frost and elfins are. So give me one moment to look them up really quick. Um, my, ooh, okay. Very good. Small non-migratory butterfly. Cool. Oh, I'm glad that you're, you're seeing new butterflies for the spring. Yay! All right, so I have pretty much only seen, um, I've pretty much only seen cabbage white butterflies so far. I did see a moth flying around, but it never landed, so I wasn't sure exactly what it was or what I saw. Um, although I did, uh, like maybe two days ago now, I was walking around out on the trails and I was uh, teaching over at the nature center I work at. And um, there was a kiddo who was like, what type of bug is that? And um, to me, as it was running across the log really quickly, it just looked like an ant. And so I told him that it was some type of probably a carpenter ant because it was fairly large. Um, and he looked at me a little bit funny, and I looked at him a little bit funny. And so we flipped over the log to follow it just to see if there was something weird about this ant. And it wasn't an ant at all. It was actually a longhorn beetle. It was an ant mimicking longhorn beetle. Um, and I did share a picture of it on my Facebook page. Um, so if you wanted to uh, go check out the uh, ant mimicking longhorn beetle that I shared, uh, you would go to facebook.com slash insectopia2015 or just add insectopia2015 and you'd be able to find my page and check it out. It was actually a really, really beautiful longhorn beetle um, and I absolutely loved it. Um, Frosted elephants are endangered, but other elephants are not. All right. Wow. So it's so cool that you have the... I was. I did go ahead and I was reading about them just a little bit for a moment there, and it said that it's uh, probably due to habitat destruction, that their populations are in decline. Um, and that makes sense. I mean, so many of our butterflies and moths have, are such, so heavily affected by, uh, by uh, the change of their environment. So, and six spotted tiger beetles. Oh man, we're having a blast. I love myself some tiger beetles. And you know me, I have this giant row of tiger beetles. Admittedly, I think it would be kind of fun one day, not today, because I'm pretty exhausted today. But I'm thinking one of one day we should go through and just kind of draw the outline of a one tiger beetle and then draw the elytra one of each of my tiger beetles because I've got a whole series of tiger beetles that are really beautiful and I think it would be really cool to see all of their designs right next to each other in a sketch. Um, I have an idea as to what I want it to look like but I think that it will just take too long to do tonight. Um, I thought it could be fun to do the Isabella tiger moth. I know we recently did a tiger moth. We did the, um, oh man, I forget the, the scientific name for it. It was the tiger moth that's the black and white stripes on the front wings, and then it has the, the pink on the hind wings. Let me, I can go and check my sketch. Give me a minute. I got this. We got this, guys. You know your, oh, there it is. Okay, so we weren't exactly sure. We just called it a tiger moth, but it was in the Appendesis genus. Uh, this guy right here. We sketched this tiger moth semi recently, um, but I thought that it would be cool to see a different species of tiger moth. Plus, this tiger moth, the Isabella tiger moth, is actually a, um, is actually the moth of the woolly bear. And I just thought it would be a whole lot of fun to sketch the woolly bear moth and to talk a little bit about it. Let me go ahead and find the page we're drawing on today. <laughs> I, I didn't save that one. Oh, come on, Trisha. Yep, this is it. 
For butterflies and other insects that emerge so early in the spring, I worry about the effects of climate change. If they come out early because of the warmth, but there's no food for them yet. Yes. That is a serious problem that people are looking into. Um, and luckily, I mean, like, it's a, it's a rough problem, right? But luckily, many of the plants also um, grow based on degree days. So, um, if the insects come out sooner, a lot of the plants develop a little bit sooner too. And I know that the time scale does significantly change um, for both of them. But hopefully, they'll move together-ish or be able to adapt. Because I, at this point, I honestly don't think there's much... I Honestly, I don't think we're going to be able to stop climate change. I think that it's going to be more like... How do we control the, uh, the negative effects of climate change on our families? Did you raise this woolly bear yourself? No, I did not. I collected the moth, um, moth by itself. All right, so up here at the top, I'm gonna write Isabella, tiger moth. Now, um, it, uh, my live stream looks the same exact to you, I believe. Um, other than you're going to notice that my hand's a little bit closer to the screen. Um, I'm working on lifting my camera up just a little bit, but this is where we're at right now. Um, and that is because I've moved into my new location. So I'm uh, working on getting a desk, but I am teaching at the dining table, which is a wonderful thing. Um, anyone else who saw me like this with like a microscope and bugs on the table would probably cringe, but I kind of love it, you know, just like just doing the thing. So let me go ahead and get us the scientific name for the Isabella tiger moth. Um, the, it is, yeah, I wasn't going to remember that. Peractia Isabella. So I have, I have collected woolly bears in the past. Um, admittedly, I don't know if I've ever actually raised them all the way through. I normally just kind of played with them and then let them go. It's dangerous if the cats jump on the table. That is very true. And, um, my cats have been pretty good about not interacting with the insects, um, and not jumping up on the table too much, but, I, Sammy, her tail goes crazy, so, um, if any of the cats ended up on the table, I would be most worried about Sammy's tail, um, because I swear she can't control it sometimes. All right. When we were looking at the previous uh, tiger moth, we talked a lot about the uh, muscle structure and the thorax and the fact that it had those um, very defined regions of hairs. Um, those are uh, those regions of hairs are connected to flight muscles, and a lot of times when you see them in when you see them alive and flying around, they're not going to be clustered like that. This is something that happens as the moth passes away um, because the, essentially the fats in the body of the moth uh, leach into the hairs and then the hairs cluster and stick together and then regularly will turn into this pattern just because of based on the, um, the muscle system in the thorax um, and the way the hairs are. You've got to excuse, you've got to excuse my yawns. I've been up for, I've been up and, and, and active for something like 14 hours now. So, um, but we're here and we're doing this because I love teaching to my California friends. You guys are just on the wrong, t in the wrong time zone. Uh, all right, so let's see if we can zoom this camera out anymore. It's looking like no, but we can't turn the camera. Is that why this moth just looks like it just got out of the shower? Yes. 
<laughs> that is quite a funny analogy, but that's exactly why this moth looks like it's like wet or it just came out of the shower. Um, a lot of times for uh, for collections, if you were going to like, if you were going to put a moth like this on display in a uh, shadow box, a lot of people will actually take the abdomens completely off of the specimen because without the abdomen, there isn't as much oil and grease that ends up in the hairs. Um, I don't particularly like that because I kind of love the, especially the tiger moth abdomens because they're so bright red and they've got those cool spots along the top, the uh, dorsal and lateral points. Um, but yes, that's exactly why it looks like it got out of the shower. <laughs> All right, um, I don't have the ability to zoom out anymore, but I can measure the head and the thorax and then the abdomen. So why not do that rather than using a uh, ruler? So thorax ends right around here. So the length of the head and the thorax combined is 0.79 centimeters. And then if I just go ahead and move the specimen up a little bit, we should be able to fit the entire abdomen into the shot. Wait a minute. I lied. I added one of the segments of the thorax, I believe. Let me check. Yeah. All right, so the abdomen is actually 0.63 centimeters. I had, um, I had counted one of the segments of the abdomen as the thorax, but we fixed it right away. So the head and the thorax is 0.63 centimeters, and then the length of the abdomen, because we can get it all in one shot, is... of 1.3 centimeters. So you've got a total of 1.9 centimeters from the, uh, 1.9 centimeters from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen. And then we can go ahead and measure the wingspan because, hey, why not? Um, I'm thinking we might just do one wing to the center and then double it because we know that insects are symmetrical. So as long as we measure it to the very center, that should be fine. All right, we're gonna measure this in two parts also, just so that um, we don't have to worry about it. Let's see, we're gonna measure from here. And this center of this dot seems like a good place to, to remember. So I'm gonna throw this number up here and we're gonna scoot it over just a little bit and I'll get you a full wingspan number. I think this'll work. We might put it next to, uh, this'll work. So this side of the wings are uh, 2.51 centimeters, so it's going to be about 5 centimeters, or 5.2. There's a part of me that... I just had my ruler, I promise. I was using it for the class right before you. That's fine. So curvaceous. Yes, I love the wings on this guy. And we're going to definitely be um, uh, having a good time sketching all of the fun angles in the front wings. base of the forewing. That's cool. So 
keep in mind that if the body length is 1.9 centimeters, then the wings of this specimen are going way past the end of the abdomen when they're closed. And you all, you will notice, let's see, this specimen was collected, oh, look at that. This specimen was collected in 2020, in March of 2020. No, July. So this specimen was collected in a, a campground in July of 2020. Um, you know, right in the middle of lockdown, we decided to go cabin camping. Haha. -ha. All right, so I am gonna go ahead and well, we're gonna sketch it a little smaller anyway because I'm so close to the camera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the length of the wings first, and I'm just going to give myself marks on my paper as kind of like the widest point that I want my moth to be, so that um, I can kind of work out and, in, and then in. So all right, if I know that this is going to be, I've got one like little mark over here and one mark way over here, and that's where I want the wings to exist for my specimen. Um, we know that the we, um, the wingspan is about 5.2 centimeters and that the, the length is about 1.9. So, if I do a tiny bit of math, it's under three times but more than double. Probably around two and a half. So it's just a little bit over two and a half times of the length. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to divide two and a half times. So I'm going to divide this into even thirds. You're going to laugh at me, but I think that this will work. <laughs> Um, I'm, gonna, I'm taking the width of the wings that I know, I'm gonna, going to divide it into even thirds, and then I'm going to take two and approximately half, and that is going to be how long my specimen is. So if I say the front of the head's right around here, right around there. No, that doesn't work. I need to be more like... Sorry guys, my brain is not all the way on. It's gonna be more like this. All right, so I have um, I've just estimated my um, my guy here, but I think that that should be about right. Alright, so I have this space that my moth is going to be within. Um, I hope that you also have a nice method for doing this. I just gave myself as wide as I wanted and then kind of eyeballed what two and a half, what, how long it should be. And your length should be, um, well your width should be two and a half times your length. You could do, a, do with it with actual math if you had a ruler and you could solve for x. And students say that algebra isn't useful. All right. The head on our moth here is nice and roundy at the top and then kind of cuts off fairly straight. Um, and we're going to go ahead and just give ourselves a, uh, a very light outline that's likely going to change over time. The, uh, a lot of times moths are very, very wide. And then, um, and they have, they're cetos, or very hairy, right? Insect hair is called cedi. And then, so I've got the head, and then the thorax. Admittedly, butterflies and moths have a very square or rectangular thorax. Um, people used to pinch grab them, um, which is essentially pinching the base of the thorax this way. And um, I've never done it, but back in the day, that's what entomologists used to do to um, collect their to collect their specimens. Um, because if you pinch them hard enough, sadly, they can't flap their wings anymore. But that also means they can't damage their specimen, and so that's why that's why people did it. It's a little sad, but they taught us it in entomology in in class too. 
show me these students who say algebra isn't useful. I know, I feel like I use algebra all the time. And, um, and a lot of like students who are just new to algebra are like, I'm never gonna need to solve for X. And I'm like, you know, you're gonna be solving for X all of the time. Every time you go shopping um, for groceries or, uh, or, or doing any type of money thing or I guess even drawing. Um, the first segment of the abdomen does come in a little bit before the uh, before it gets kind of bulbous. So I'm gonna just go ahead and give it this little shape here, and then we're gonna come out and we're gonna make the abdomen nice and wide, but likely not as wide as the thorax. So it's gonna kind of curve out a little bit. Um, it has this little bit of a of like a um, I don't want to call it a fluff at the end of the abdomen, but there is a little bit of a, like, a, a pinch here. And that left side is truer than the right side. So the right side does have a little bit of an indentation, so it's not as, like, accurate. The left side is more like what the specimen would look like, so it does come in a little bit, and then essentially it kind of fluffs out here. So if you give it you don't want it to be too angulate. And we'll probably come back and fix these. We're just giving this nice light outline to have something to work with. I wish my camera would show the whole screen on my microscope because I can see the whole both wings from here. But the camera is not going to show that. It has a smaller uh, view of Alright, we're going to just go ahead and start with the left wing. Um, like I've mentioned before, when you are, uh, when you're spreading an insect, um, especially butterflies, you want the hind edge of the front wing to make a horizontal or perpendicular line to the middle body point here. So you want this edge to go straight across on this right wing and then line up on the left wing on the other side that we can't see right now. And that is also going to be right around this area here. I didn't take into consideration the width of the body when doing the length of the abdomen. That's fine. So the wings are going to come, I'm going to be going past my mark because I need to take into consideration the, uh, the length of the, the width of the abdomen. Excuse me. I meet those students every day in my calculus classes. Oh, that's so funny. I love that, Susan. All right, so this wing is coming up fairly straight, and then once you get to about two-thirds of the way in, it arches down and kind of straightens out. That leading side is a little sharper than the bottom side, so we're going to kind of round it back out like this, and that's going to give us an overall shape that is accurate enough to start with, The hind wing, uh, the hind wing doesn't line up exactly to the front wing. It is a little bit lower. Admittedly, the side on the left is pulled up a little bit. I'm going to start my area out here. Let's go look at where the hind wing hits the abdomen, where the hind wing hits the thorax. Oh, we can hit fit the whole hind wing. How exciting. All right, so uh, you want to make sure that the hind wing is coming out of the thorax and not that abdomen segment here. Um, it is not very wide. It isn't very wide. It's kind of narrow. And it also has that squared off tip at the top. So
So um, your wing is going to kind of come out and then round down. And you see the, the tip on the hind wing is, is pretty squared off. You, we are going to want it to, we don't want it to be a perfect square. But that will give you the approximate wings. And then what I'm going to do... <clears throat> is narrow my body. Because I think that it was going to look kind of funny with such a huge body and long, um, and the wrong shape of that wing. So that'll be a lot better. I kind of split it almost in half. That's funny. And I'm going to go ahead and sketch the other side of the wings just because um, normally I only do one side, but feeling special today. Maybe we'll just do the outline of the both wings and then we'll pick one to do the uh, front, the wing venation of. I think that's pretty accurate. Look at that, I like the left wing better already, and it took me a lot less time, funny enough. Alright, let's go zoom in on the head. and moths from a dorsal point of view, honestly, the head is not the most interesting place to look. But I feel like we might as well see what we can see from the top. And from this point of view, we can see the entirety of the, uh, of the antenna. Oh, check this out. Ladies and gentlemen, I actually have the uh, video of me poking a bombardier beetle in Arizona. Wait. Right here. Come back. Oh no, the video moved. Oh, that was cool. Watch my camera freeze. Aw, man. Oh well. Um, it doesn't want to show you. I'm sorry. I have a fun video of me poking a bombardier beetle and then it explodes. It like shoots out its chemicals. You know, bombardier beetles have the ability to spray a chemical at over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It burned my finger a little bit, but I didn't even feel it. Yes, it did blast me. Um, and it was awesome. Uh, I could reload the video. Let me see if I can reload the video and, and, and make it make it do the video thing by playing and staying on the screen. Oh, later. So I've got to turn it. No. My computer is not happy with live streaming and showing the video at the same time. <laughs> oh, that was cool. <laughs> okay. That's not going to work just yet, but uh, maybe one day I'll be able to show it to you. Or share it on my face. Maybe I'll just share it on my Facebook page, then you can see it. So, because we made the body so much smaller, I'm going to be making the head smaller too. I think that it became kind of too bulbous, and I want to make sure that that head is pretty short here on the um, on the thorax, and that it is a little bit, um, not a, it's not as wide as the thorax here, but you can see, you can see that dividing edge between the head and the thorax, and you can see the entirety of the antenna. They're coming off of both sides. Um, maybe you could just post the video on your channel. Oh, I guess that's true. That's true, I could post it as a YouTube short. I'll go ahead and do that. Um, give me a couple days. I'm still unpacking and trying to uh, organize everything else, but I should be able to get that YouTube short pretty quick. 
right. So now I just zoomed in to so, to check out the antenna for myself, and the antenna of this moth are not bipectinate or feathery or feathery like many other moths are. They're mostly just kind of straight, but they're also a little thick. And they narrow at the ends. And then there are many segments. I'm not going to count them. Okay. Let's scoot to the thorax. So you normally don't see the, um, the, these Isabella tiger moths until a little bit later in the summer because they don't overwinter as cocoons or chrysalids like many other Lepidopteran. They actually overwinter as caterpillars. And then when spring happens, then they pupate and turn into a cocoon and then will eventually emerge as a, as a moth. But it takes them a whole lot of time. All right, I'm going to give myself this outer shape here for the thorax. So I'm just going to come here and do the outer shape pretty dark real quick. And then the bottom line, instead of it being so straight, I'm going to give it a really kind of wide U shape here. Um, then within the thorax, we're going to add those four bits of hairs here. So... The one that comes out in this direction, the one that comes out in this direction, and then the two kind of in the center. And that's just all about, that's all about um, musculature. All right. Um, after our thorax here, we're going to be pulling this section down. I believe that this section here is the last segment of the thorax because the front wing is connected to the first segment, the hind wing is connected to the second segment, and there's supposed to be another segment of the thorax. So my guess is that it's this right here. And I'm actually pretty happy with that shape happening. Although I think that there's probably too much bulbous happening here, which is why it looks so funny. I think I'm going to narrow these down just a little bit. We do want it to get wider and narrower, but I don't think we want it so bulbous. So let's go ahead. I'm going to scooch, scooch, scooch. Alexa thinks I'm trying to speak to her. I'm having trouble connecting to the agent. Take a look at the whole section in your other All right. If I rotate the specimen just a little bit, we have the ability to see the entire abdomen at one time. Um, I'm counting one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. If that last kind of bulbous area of the abdomen is a is one segment, I'm counting seven segments. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and kind of give myself a light outline of where each of these segments are. I do it light the first time just in case it's um, not, and just in case I need to add more or less. One, two, three. Four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four. It looks like the fourth segment is the widest. And then after you get to after you get from four, you have five, six, and seven. Yes, that go shorter. And five and six, six is where it gets narrow, and then seven kind of comes out, and I'm just going to make it 
kind of very light like this. I think that that'll be fine. Um, so a lot of times I will also see where the abdomen is going to kind of peak at the viewer. And then above that point, I will arch the angles up. And then below that point, I will arch them down. I'm sorry, my camera froze. So we're just going to fix that really quick. And I'm going to go ahead and outline this um, abdomen really nice and dark. Now, there isn't a whole lot of, um, like, segmentation in between, so I'm okay with not, like, uh, shingling them as heavily as we might, like, a wasp. And then I'm thinking after four, that's when the abdomen starts to go away from you, so instead of angling those lines up, I'm going to angle them down. Make it look kind of fancy-like. It has to do with the way that your eye sees the uh, specimen. to leave it a little bit lower so that 
my insects stay on the page and um, you can see more detail because it's closer to my to, to my sketch. I believe it's called the discal cell. Give me a minute. So a lot of times we are looking at the discal cell, spelled D-I-S-C-A-L, um, and that's one of the first things that I look for when I am looking at wing venations, at least in the front wing. Um, so I'm noticing here that the discal cell It looks like it's this cell right here. Um, the This spot here is on the top left corner of the discal cell. And then we have a number of veins that are coming off of it in certain areas. All right. So one of the first veins that generally people sketch is the... Uh, is the coastal cell or the C cell, um, that's this, or C vein, um, that's this vein here on the leading edge of the wing. Um, sometimes you'll see holes at the base of it from where somebody poked a hole behind that vein and then pulled the wings forward. You can also use butterfly forceps, which is something I'm more commonly using recently, but um, I used to just... Uh, Put an itty itty bitty tiny pin through the wing and pull them up to sit them there. And it's still a valid option. Alright, so um, I am imagining kind of where the uh, where the butterfly wing kind of angles. And I'm going to say it's probably right around here. That this is going to be like the dot, the, 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 the darker spot that's a little bit further, and the split in the Ys. I think this will work. Alright, so from here at the top, we're going to do the next vein is the subcoastal vein. And the subcosta runs along the costa, but then once you hit about two thirds, it splits and turns into two. All right, now I can use that split as a reference point. Uh, the next the next vein is actually going to be one of the veins within the um, within the discal cell. So it's going to come up about halfway to where the split would be, so right around here. And then we're gonna give it we're gonna angle it down a little bit, kind of give it a point here, and then pull it back. That's the discal cell. Sometimes this cell is a lot larger in the front wing. Um, this is actually pretty small, but it seems to be working out for the boss, so. All right, um, from this angle here, before you come forward, there is a vein coming out from right around here, and it, goes out, but then right underneath where this one splits, it doesn't even split one time. It splits three times. So you can kind of give it a, um, a pitchfork where you're going to do two on the outside and then a third one that comes through. And that is exactly where the darker spot is in the wing. So I'm going to go ahead and just add a little bit of graphite here and kind of smudge in a darker spot right here amongst this, um, amongst this break. All right, so we've got those taken care of. It appears no, it's just one. So there is one more that comes off of the top here and it looks like it just projects down to closer here. Uh, we have one more right about that, that ends here at this angle and goes this way to the very bottom of the front wing. And then you've got the anal, anal vein that um, is going to be this right here, this U. And it's
it's going to go off, Paige. Yay. All right, so that is our left front wing. Now all we've got to do is the hind wing. darker spot at the beginning, which is going to be right around here. Okay. Uh, but there is this large cell. So what do these caterpillars eat and what do the adults eat? giving me because you can see it has those giant compound eyes but um, all of 
its hair looks a little bit kind of messy and wet, and it's just like, oh my goodness. You always find getting the wing venations right first is so helpful for placing the markings. I have to agree with you that getting, you know, so then you know exactly where the spots are going to exist. The only time it makes it a little bit more difficult is if the, um, is if the wing veins are hard to see. Because sometimes they can be a little bit tricky. But we know where all of the spots are. And I was realizing I didn't put the colorations on the abdomen. And I do want to add the dark bands to the abdomen, both the dorsal and the lateral ones. So let's go ahead and do that before we leave. My camera keeps turning on me. All right. So... Um, right here along this center line and each one of these spots are stopped and subdivided at the um, at the uh, doop, 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 in the individual segments so we've got dark spots that are coming down the center of the abdomen here and a lot of them look kind of chevron like or uh, rectangular with a notch out of the top just make sure you give some separation in between them because they uh, they are not all uh, connected. In fact, a lot of uh, tiger moths are going to have very similar markings. Um, and then we can see a little bit of them on the lateral, so I'm just going to kind of give it... I'm going to make it fairly um, obvious on the top and then make them smaller as they go towards the bottom. Because then you have the colors on the hind wings too, the or on the abdomen too, and the um, the little puff, the little final segment here doesn't have any of that. Snuffle up again! Aww, maybe that's what he reminds you of. The snuffle up again always looked angry to me too. And if we wanted to turn this specimen all the way upside down, I'm sorry, I don't understand consummate V's. I wish I did. Oh my goodness, look how cute it is. <laughs> She's so fluffy, I'm gonna die! Uh, you can actually see the proboscis here. So, she didn't wind up her proboscis. It's kind of just out and hanging out with her chest hairs. <laughs> That's great. Very, very good. All right, so that is our Isabella tiger moth, or the moth of the woolly bear. Uh, woolly bears were always so much fun to play with growing up. I absolutely loved them. Um, I would pick them up and watch them walk around and stuff, and you know what? It is kind of surprising that I never tried to rear one all the way through into adulthood, because I reared so many other caterpillars into moths. But I always just kind of figured that they were probably some boring brown moth because they were, uh, I knew they were moth, so I never even tried. Um, good shiny metallic disco ball eyes! Yeah! She, she says, I better have big shiny eyes. Let's see what happens when we zoom in. There you go. You can see the split in the, uh, in the proboscis here. Right, right there. Because the proboscis is actually a sheath. If you've ever, uh, watched a butterfly actually drinking from a flower, um, 
the end of the proboscis will split open and then the straw is actually on the inside. Although the uh, sheath that pr protects the straw isn't sharp like a true bug. Hi Chaos! It's so nice to have you here. Um, admittedly, I wasn't going to live stream for too long tonight because I'm pretty tired. I've done, um, I had a library program today and I've got another one tomorrow. Um, and so I had to drive to New Jersey and yeah, it was a good time, but I am, I am very well, fairly well done. And I think we've drawn a beautiful tiger moth. It looks a little bit, let's see if I can get it in front of the ca camera, looks a little bit like this. I did just draw the one side, but um, admittedly I should be able to get that copied over to the other side pretty easily. Um, if I was going to change something about my sketch, I would say that the wings need to be longer and the abdomen needs to be shorter. I didn't get the, uh, I didn't get the ratio quite right on my specimen here. So this is what our moth looks like in real life. So you can see that the wings are kind of a lot longer than the abdomen. But when I sketched mine, it looks like my wings could pretty much cover my abdomen. So maybe next time. Chaos, you're in India now? Weren't you in Germany before? changed your username? I don't remember there being an E in your name. That's really cool. Awesome. Well, you're going to have to let us know about the awesome bugs in India. I believe the domino roach is native to India, and that's one of those that I'd always have loved to see in person. Um, so you'll have to let me know if you see any. I want to travel the world. Oh, very good. So you have a, a new name in a new country? That's awesome. And you'll be able to join us next week. Oh, right? There are, I'm sure there are great bugs in India. I, in fact, I had a friend who went and traveled to India, and he brought back all types of pictures of what he saw, and I was a little jealous of some of them. All right, so I want to say... I want to say a thank you so much for hanging out with me this Thursday evening. I had a great time. Um... Keep in mind, I also teach on a pl 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 platform called Out School for ages 5 to 8, 9 to 12, and 13 to 17, depending on what level of entomology you're at. I have some students who are 8 that are taking the 9 to 12 class. I have some, like, 13-year-olds also taking it. It's a little bit of a mismatch of everybody. Um, and there's students from all over the world. So if you know a bug lover who wants to get to know other bug lovers of the same age, um, it's a great place to be. And then we get to talk about a new insect every week. And instead of doing black and white type scientific illustrations like we do here, um, let's see. We do more colorful things like, oh, my junior bug club, my five to eight year olds learned about dragonflies today. And we talked about what they um, what they do in the underwater and their eyes. And did you know that the fastest dragonfly um, is in Australia? And it flew 96 kilometers an hour, which breaks down to just underneath 60 miles an hour. And I think that that is crazy. I thought that the record was 35. But the record is actually 60. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, so I teach on out school. If you want the uh, link for the uh, for twenty dollars free towards classes, you can find that in the doobly doo below. Um, make sure you subscribe to my channel. Those of you who are chatting in the chat, I appreciate you. You have already subscribed to my channel, and that is how we stop all of the crazy bot people from chatting um, in the chat box. We just make sure that they need to be subscribed first. Um, 
that down there is a QR code. If you've really enjoyed hanging out with me today, if you've really enjoyed the class, you can go ahead and send me a couple of dollars. It's always, always, always super appreciated. I do these classes um, to interact with you and to make sure that I get to share my love with not only little kids, but also older kids too. I feel like, you know, um, us older, you know, people want all classes also. And um, I've had a request to do some Zoom classes for adults, like some type of insect club. I have to figure out what that would exactly look like, but um, I had a request to do that, so we'll see what happens. My house is near a forest. I will try to get some photos. That would be awesome, Chaos. Oh, really? Elephant Whisperer. I don't know if I've ever watched it, but I'm or the documentary, but I'm going to have to look it up. Yeah, I haven't seen it either, like Susan. But it should be really cool to look it up so that I can see kind of where you're where you're living, where you are. Um uh, on Facebook and Instagram, I am at Insectopia2015. That's my tag. And then you can always email me your sketch or bug questions or pictures of new bugs or whatever you would like. If there is an insect-related question or drawing or topic or an article that you read that you really want to share with me, I love to hear from you. So um, you can email me at Trisha at theinsectopia.com. Um, and that will get you directly to me. I try very, very, very hard to get to everybody within 24 hours. Every now and again, my email slipped to 48 or 72, but we are, um, I'm pretty responsive. So go ahead and reach out and I can, um, get you all of the answers that you would like. And if I don't have the answers to your insect-related question, I should know somebody that does. Because not only am I an entomologist, but... I have all types of entomology friends. <laughs> all right. Have a wonderful rest of your week. I look forward to seeing you on Sunday. I hope everybody had a lovely Easter. I was off last week, last Sunday for Easter. But we will be back this Sunday for more insect sketches. Have a wonderful rest of your week. And stay buggy.